Thank you very much. And now we are going to switch to the plenary session in three minutes. So I would like to invite Professor Karimi. Uh, but I would like to first introduce him. Let's wait for two minutes because you know that trans uh, video transmission is online. I'd also like to pass a warm welcome from Professor Arkadiusz Mężyk, director of the university. Unfortunately, the Senate uh, meeting is a bit longer than expected, and he was unable to come at the moment, but he's going to visit us soon, so I welcome him. Thank you very much one more time for coming for the plenary session. I would like to warmly welcome Professor Hamid Reza Karimi. Professor Karimi is with us. Can you please show up to everybody? <laughs> Professor Karimi is a very famous researcher. I would like to provide you some information about his achievements. He's a sen senior member of IEEE. He received the Bachelor of Science degree with honors in power systems from the Sharif University of Technology, Tehran in Iran in 1998 and MSc and PhD with honors degrees in control systems engineering from the same university. Uh, he's currently a professor of applied mechanics with the Department of Mechanical Engineering Politecnico di Milano in it Italy. He's also a director of the International Institute of Acoustics and Vibration. His current research interests include control system synthesis, vibration analysis and control, artificial intelligence, Lapunov methods, nonlinear control systems, uncertain systems, time varying systems, observers, and delays. Professor Karimi is also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cyber Physical Systems, the Journal of Machines, the International Journal of Aerospace Systems, Science and Engineering, and the Journal of Designs, the section editor-in-chief of the Journal of Electronics, and the Journal of Science Progress, a subject editor of Journal of the Franklin Institute and an associate editor for some international journals such as IEEE Transactions on Industrial Informatics, IEEE Transactions on Fuzzy Systems, IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks and Learning Systems, IEEE Transactions on Circuits and Systems, uh, IEEE ASME Transactions on Mechatronics and IEEE Transactions on Systems, MEN and Cybernetic Systems. He was general chair, keynote speakers, or program chair for several international conferences. Uh, Professor Karim is famous for his very many books, including vibration monitoring and control, about 1,000 1, publications, and about 30,000 citations, and his age index reaching about 100. He has been a web of science highly cited researcher in engineering for last six years. I have the pleasure to collaborate with Hamid for a few years. We are implementing a joint uh, Horizon Europe project. We have uh, three publications. Each one is in better, better journal. So we started from the top 10, then top five, and top one publication. So I very, very much open to collaboration with Professor Karimi. Hamid, thank you very much for coming. Just a week ago, I visited his university, and we spent very nice and very fruitful time there. It's very my pleasure to invite you and please give us a very good, interesting uh, plenary presentation. You're welcome to take it. The floor is yours. Let's welcome one. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, so my good friend, so Professor Pavelcik. 
And also I would like to thank first uh, from the, uh, the head of the scientific committee of the PCC conference, Professor Corbis, for inviting me to deliver this uh, speech to the, the Polish control conference. So I know that this conference is organized every three years and it's very exciting to come to such an event. So it's looked like the football, the soccer game, so as a World Cup for the control society. And it's my honor and pleasure to be in Gilevich at the Silesian University of Technology mm -hmm. and have this opportunity to, to address. So some of the new result has been achieved in our group so to this, uh, to this session. So first of all, I'm coming from the University of the Politecnico di Milano, so from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And then you can see this is the entrance of the building 23. So uh, today the lecture is about the uh, uh, intelligent fault diagnosis for rotary machinery. So the outline of this presentation, I'm going to give very briefly to the introduction to the faults in this complex system, and then I'm coming to review uh, some progress on the intelligent based fault diagnosis, and also there are some new development uh, from the using the deep learning techniques for such a fault diagnosis problem, and also some new development about the AI explainable, how to explain the fault in the, based on the, the model has been uh, developed based on the, some learning model, for instance, based on CNN, the convolution neural networks. The last but not least, I will talk about some new result based on the multi-source information fusion. So when we talk about the faults, first we need to look at how the industry has been progressed. So if we look at the transition from the first to the second to the third, and currently to the fourth generation, so now we notice that the system are becoming uh, large and larger, and it means that the, from the data acquisition, we have more data, and now the problem is that if we want to capture any failure or any fault in the system, the system, this problem becomes more com complicated. So the good thing is that, uh, so in context of the cyber physical system or CPS in the context of the industry 4.0s, the condition monitoring could be the good solution to monitor the state of the system. So if we look at the three aspects of the detection, diagnostics, and the prognostics, so LD detection, so these three steps in the DDP problem should be realized, and it means that based on this realization, we can reach the maintenance. So the umbrella as a condition monitoring so they can save and they can give the profit to the industry in terms of the reducing the cost of the maintenance. So regarding to the rotary machinery, if we look at the, some fault, it could be happen. So we can expect so many applications. So from the milling industry coming to some application to the wind energy, even to the, some the vehicles, then we can see that this kind of the system we are facing, so with many components, at any time you can expect some failure, and if this failure is continuing, so it can give a damage to the system operation. So therefore, the fault in this context is very important, so not only based on the cost and also the maintenance cost, and of course based on the safety, so for instance, for the aircraft, and if you look at the, the train, or some other application. So the safety is the first priority, and this means that we need to improve so the, 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 the safety of the system operation. So, th but the issue is that if you look at this context, so we need to develop the sort of the health management system, and this was the first was introduced in the aerospace industry. So this uh, system, it has the five mechanisms. So first, it, it means that we need to look at incipient failure detection it means how to detect the failure before the occurrence or the substantially affect the system performance. And then we need to prevent the fault progression because if the fault exists and if the fault is, uh, is progressed in the system, so it can bring also the failures. So the prediction of the progression from the fault to the failure, this means the cost is the maintenance and this also should be from the economic point of view. So this mechanism should be also considered and then coming to the some sort of the maintenance planning. So in, in terms of the developing some idea for inventory planning, so to, to, uh, to economize 
on the maintenance effort. It means that this is also the fourth stage for the health management. The last but not least is the control. So the PCC, the, the control society, so now you can see that in the context of the health management is located in the f stage number five. But this means that we can accommodate the fault in terms of the fault tolerant control, FTC. In this case, so we have some possibility to, to reduce the magnitude of the fault and the system can have a life uh, to enhance the life, uh, uh, the, the useful lifetime of the system. So the last, uh, the, the, the conclusion could be that the reliability and the maintenance should be enhanced at the same time the operation maintenance cost should be reduced. This is a game and if you want to solve this problem, we need to look at the health management context. So therefore, we look at the health management for some application like a wind farm. So we know that in Europe, the wind farm is developing so the, in, in different uh, regions. But important is that if you look at the, for instance, the offshore turbine, so the, if you look at the, the, the number of the sensor located for each turbine, and if you collect the data as a scalar data every 10 minutes, then you can see that you have a big data and this data should be analyzed in terms of the some, uh, for example, some health monitoring stage. So if you look at the detection, isolation, quantification, and also about the prognostics, so it means that if you design, for instance, the control reconfiguration based on the FTC, the fault to run control, you can accommodate the some level of the fault in the system. But now you can notice that uh, if you want to in enhance the RUL, the remaining useful life uh, of the system, so we need to look at the maintenance, the RCM, the reliability center maintenance. And this was the reason that if the uh, offshore wind uh, start in Europe, the Siemens is the big company, they started to establish the unit, the center in Denmark only for the RCM. It means that they are looking at the, some sort of the maintenance planning, resource planning, inventory planning, and then you can see that they can also enhance the reliability. But in this context, you can see that the condition monitoring, if you look at the market from the, the, for the wind turbine, you can see that for, uh, for the large turbine, for, for than 2.3 megawatt in the US market, the condition monitoring already implemented for more than 90 percentage. So this means that we need to look at the data. But now the big problem is uh, starting from this position, how to look at the data and how, which component so for this system should be monitored. So this was the challenge for us. And then we noticed that the one solution could be moving from the classical to the intelligent approach. Of course, in the context of the intelligent approach, we have a three aspect of the supervisory learning, unsupervised learning, and even we can use some sort of the reinforcement learning to, for the system to interact with, uh, with the complex environment. But what we are looking for, we are looking at the data acquisition and then coming to the diagnostics. If you look at uh, this context, so either the supervised or unsupervised, so you need to classify the fault. And this is a, one of the, the aim of this uh, diagnosis. So based on the unsupervised learning, the first is using a standard autoencoder. So it means that you have a, the, the large, so the, for example, the, the data, for example, you can compress it based on compression in the encoder and coming to the decoder part and based on the, how many layers you have, so you can build this uh, unsupervised learning based on the autoencoder. But of course, you can get some advantage in, in terms of the computational speed, but still we have a problem about the, the dimension, the high dimension. So nowadays we can in, uh, develop different or so sort of the, the autoencoder by adding some layers, for example, Yes, uh, and then the feature extraction could be done at a different layer. So this is sort of a feature extraction, but it's still, so adding the different layers, it can bring some, uh, still some problem about the dimensionality and also implementation on the chip, so basic uh, 
this could be another issue. And recently, we have developed some other techniques, but in this presentation, we have no time to discuss. So we are adding some advanced signal processing techniques in, in, uh, instead of adding more layers in the, in the autoencoder. So another context could be the supervised learning, so a convolution neural network. And for instance, if you have the images of VGG16, so if you can use it based on the transfer learning. And if you look at this uh, structure, you can see that from the, the convolutional blocks, you can use uh, this kind of the, uh, transfer learning procedure. So this also has some benefits so, uh, in terms of accuracy and also computational. But the see the problem in, from engineering aspect is two things. First, sometimes you need to transfer the data. So this the data transformation, it brings some, some uh, problems in the engineering side. And the second, and the more important, is the need of the high number of uh, samples per class for classification. So now the VG60, you need a 500, and even if you develop different sort of the convolution neural network, for instance, this design, so then you can see that even if you avoid any data transformation at the beginning, and then you can use the raw data as a vibrational signal, but you can use the ID as a wide kernel, then you can see it by 64, for example, the filtering, so you can basically to develop the same structure of the convolutional blocks and then fully connected layer and then you can use the softmax. So this structure, this can give a benefit so you can design the classification without the signal processing on the raw data. But you see the problem is that you need a high number of samples per class. It means that in some databases we don't have these numbers. So based on this reason, so there are more progress in the literature, so in how to solve this problem. So the first idea could be using the shallow learning. Shallow learning means that why we don't use the traditional neural networks, for instance, for the data for the fault classification. So if you start to look at the fault in electrical machines, so if you look at the electrical fault and also mechanical fault, then we have a, some sort of the, for example, if you see a stator, for example, the, the fault, or if you have a broken rotor bar fault. So what will happen, you have some vibration in electrical circuit, and it means that from electrical point of view, the air gap eccentricity will be changed. So based on the change of the air gap magnetic field, then you can see that, of course, the vibrational in the frequency, so this could be a good indication to detect the, the failure in the machine. But of course, we should have some knowledge, and the knowledge means that at which frequency the fault can be occurred. Then if, you, if you know the rotor frequency, FR, and if you know the other frequency, for example, the outer raceway frequency, FV, and then if you know the supply frequency, then you can calculate at which frequency the, the, the harmonics, it, it can represent, for example, a bearing fault, or a stator winding fault, or air gap eccentricity, or broken rotor bar fault. But now you can see that we are talking about a limited number of the fault classification, but still the problem is about the noise, because in the electrical machine we have a harmonics from the inverter. And therefore, if you look at the, some mathematical investigation on the electrical part, if you look at the voltage in a stator and also in the rotor part, you can see that the sum inductance is a function of the sum function of the function J. So this function J is a, a represent the air gap in the machine. But if you look at these uh, bearings, if, if you look at the outer raceway fault, if, if the orientation of the rotation of the bearings come in this position, so the center of the rotor uh, slightly will be changed. So this change in the, in the center of the rotor, it brings some additional uh, sum uh, to the function of J, and this function of J is changing, and that's it, that by having the fault, so the air gap magnetic field will be changed. So this could be one indication to get this idea for the fault classification. But now, if you want to execute, if you want to test it in the lab, so in the closed loop fault diagnosis, you can use, for example, FOC, fault oriented control, or you can use DTC, the direct torque control. So if you look at the two plots on the, the bottom left, you can see that if you, for example, the, the, uh, look at the harmonic, they are representing, the, for example, the healthy, uh, the healthy motor for this uh, current spectrum. Uh, but this is also the healthy case for, the, for this uh, motor based on the DTC. 
But the point is that if you have an air cap eccentricity fault, then you will see some harmonics that can appear, and based on information of the location of the fault, you can capture these two frequencies represented, for example, FAG. But if you look at the figure on the right, then you can see the magnitude will be changed, and this represents another air gap fault based on DTC. So now you can see that in the, in the, control, so in the control context, in the closed loop control, if you are looking for the fault, we need to pay attention to the magnitude of the fault because the robust control, you can minimize the magnitude, but the fault still exists, and this can bring some failure in the future. So we have already tested for the different uh, as a rotational speed, then you can see that in this context, if you look at the current spectrum for the single line, for the broken rotobar fault, or for the, for example, for a state or turn fault, or for, uh, for the bearing outer race fault, then the FOC and DTC, they show the ability to show at which frequency at the, and uh, corresponds to a speed the fault can be occurred. So this is a, some sort of the, the, to tabulate, so the, the information of the fault based on the frequency, based on the rotational speed. But now you can imagine that these are based on the vibrational data, so, but if you, if you for example, if the speed is, is uh, decreasing for the low speed rotation, this is another challenge if you want to implement this idea. So now we try to implement uh, some filtering. If for, insta for instance, we can design such a filtering and we call it as the RNFC, as a removing non-bearing fault component. So you can include here as a shallow learning, for example, in the neural network, and they look at the, the error signal. The error signal has the highest percentage of the contribution of the fault. It means that by analyzing the error signal, we are expecting to, to classify, uh, detect the fault. Of course, you can use the other line network, and this is a very simple uh, neural network based on the, the data we have. The vector P, these are the, some sample vibrational signal and the healthy case. You can basically train the network. So by training the network and also by classification, even if you have a four class, so then you can see that we have an inner race, outer race, and also double holes. And if you look at this classification based on the data set we have, so we have used this machine, so this is a sort of the, the, the laboratory uh, machine. So we, here we have some uh, the electrical motor, and then here we have a bearing house. You can replace different sort of the bearings, and here you, you can use the accelerometer in the X and Z direction to collect the vibrational data. So based on this data acquisition, so we notice that these are the vibrational signal, these are the accelerate, accelerometer signal, then the blue one is the without the healthy signal, red one is for the inner race, red signal in the bottom figure for the, the outer race fault, and the blue uh, uh, curve is for the double hold fault. So based on the vector P for the training, you can get your data set. This data set is useful based on the RMS value, variance and also kurtosis and skewness you can use for the training and also for the testing and validation. So if you uh, do it like this, then you can see that for the shallow learning, for this uh, structure of the network, so you can, uh, with a very high percentage, you can classify the fault. But even if you increase the number of the layers, no, uh, you don't get zero. This is uh, very careful that if you want to use basically the increasing the number of layers, we need to pay attention to what is the structure of the network. Even if you don't use RNFC, you can see that the percentage of the, uh, the classification is much lower. Well, another idea could be the robustness to the noise. So if you have a low quality data with a different uh, uh, noise, then you can see that for the, the noisy data, then the, the, you can see the effect of RNFC uh, compared to the case of the without RNFC. So this example is could be good to use the, the some intelligent approach, but still we have a pr several problems about the, the network's design and also about the data, about the noise. So now we try to enhance this architecture coming to more advanced techniques based on the deep learning, and this was the residual wide kernel deep convolution autoencoder. So first of all, we should know that if you are using a standard autoencoder, the problem was about the high dimensional signal, 
And if you look at the CNN as a convolutional neural network in the context of the supervised learning, the problem is the two things about the overfitting and also about uh, some sort of the limited data set because you have a huge number of data sets uh, per class, so for classification. So this was the reason that uh, we need to modify so our autoencoder, and therefore we came to this solution, and this solution is, uh, we call it the RWKDCAE. So if you look at the autoencoder, for instance, if we are using the raw data, we don't have any transformation. And the first convolutional block, you can see that here we have a 35. 35 is the size of the kernel function. It means that we are using the wide kernel, and if you are using the wide kernel, we avoid any data transformation. The second point about the transfer learning, some information can be sent from the, the encoder to decoder part, these are the residual signal, and then based on this architecture, we can uh, design the unsupervised learning process. So this was the reason that uh, we uh, look at the, also the loss function and also how to train the, uh, this uh, AE. And this was uh, the reason that this RWKDSC, uh, KDSA has given some good performance, and I will show you some, uh, some results. So first of all, if you look at the data set, so the, this data, the vibrational data, so first you need to find your sample. So if you take as a 1024 point as each sample, for instance, for the 5,000 sample point, then you can see that how many samples you have per class. And therefore, the CNN kind of this supervised learning is definitely is not helpful in this case because you have a limited number of samples per class. So if you use some filtration, uh, basically to try to capture some features, and these features is goes from the different convolutional blocks, and then you can extract, and then you can decide about the, 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 the fault classification. So now we have uh, two things. First, if you look at the picture, the, the uh, for example, this plot on the left, the, these are the some visualization of the features. Uh, we got it from the, the encoder of the RWKDCAE. Now you can see that all the signals are positive because in this context we are using uh, some RELU function, rectified linear unit function, it's always positive. But if you look at the, the plot on the right side, these are the FFT plot, is a f uh, from the frequency plot. So now what is the motivation? Then you can see that the, the features uh, we have visualized from this uh, RWKDCA, so it, it has a, some a sort of the, the, the basic the, the matching to the, 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 the plot we got it from the feature of the FFT. But the point is that on the right side, if you want to make a decision, the real time is based on the data processing, but the left side, the model is already learned how to, to generate these kind of the features. So now I will show you the, the performance of these two approach. So the, we need to use some data. So the first data set is the open source data set for the bearing from the case first and reserve university. So this data set is complicated because there are 10 classes. One is a healthy case, and then there are nine different classes for the fault for the different mechanical the, the types. And for this reason, we have a different mechanical type for the, for the out, inner race fault for the bearings, outer race, and also the ball fault. And this kind of the fault the waveform we can capture for the, these CWRU bearings. So now we uh, also we uh, use the second data set for the gearbox, and this gearbox data set, so we are looking at this, this uh, data set from Southeast University. They have used this test bench, and then you see 10 the waveform here. So this data set is also has the, 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 the two different operating conditions, and each operating condition has a five class problems, so one healthy case, and also we have four failure types. So now based on this data set, we want to examine our approach. So this is uh, the plot. If you look at these uh, four uh, graphs, so the top uh, uh, left, so it shows a standard autoencoder if you want to use for the feature learning extraction. So from the, so now you can see that the standard autoencoder is not able to classify the, the fault, the basically for the, the bearing fault. Uh, but the point is that if you are using the, this the kind of the unsupervised learning based on the, the, this RWKDCA, the fault can be classified.
But even if you come to the supervised learning part for the same RWKDC, then you can see that the 10 classes, they can, uh, very, uh, uh, they can be separated, classified very well. So the figure right bottom part is the classification based on FFT. Now you can see that this learning model based on the RWKDC is already learned how to classify. So the, uh, the, 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 the data set we have, and also the, even if the performance is better than the, the, the FFT and also some investigation in the frequency. So this was the one that the, the performance of the system and we tried to compare it also for the, uh, for the data set for the gearbox. The same the discussion we have, you can see that a standard autoencoder is not able to classify the fault, but if you are moving to the RWKDCA, for the unsupervised and the supervised, you can see that the classification for the five classes for the gearbox fault are quite good. And this is the result from FFT, and then you can see that the how effective is this the learning model we have developed for the fault classification. So another issue is that this uh, RWKDC should be examined to, to the fault classification for the different operating condition. Now you can see that for the different operating condition from A to E, and if you look at the classification percentage for this, you can see that it's, it's a superior to some existing approach, and even you can see that with the less sample data, I will show you later on, you can get such a good performance. And then for the gearbox, and the gearbox also we have a two frequency, and therefore for the, the different data sets, uh, the different operating condition, also, this algorithm shows a good uh, performance. So another testing could be, for example, for the different working conditions. This is very important because if you design the, the, this kind of the learning model, so for one operating condition, and if the data set is changing to another operating condition, so this also should, uh, the, the, the performance should be tested again. And for the ch transition from A to B, A to C, now you can see that for the buildings and also for the gearbox, so the percentage of the default classification based on this algorithm is also quite uh, uh, as significant compared to uh, other techniques. So this uh, uh, shows about the noise, because if, uh, if we talk about the low quality data about effect of the noise, then you can see that for the high noise, and if you compare it for different operating condition, so then you can see that RWKDC is also is effective. And this is also another that the pair shows the performance of this model in, from looking at based on the, the, uh, the noise. So this is also for the gearbox, and then we also notice that, that even for the high a different SNR, so the performance of the, this uh, technique is also is, uh, is, uh, is acceptable compared to other, tech, other uh, algorithm for this uh, fault uh, classification. And this uh, slide is also important about uh, uh, the main part of the, the motivation to design RWKDC. As I mentioned before, that you need a high number of samples per class. So if you want to classify based on supervised learning. So therefore, we compare for the 10 percentage of the proportion of the data set. So the, even the RWKDC compared to other uh, so new approach, because the other approach of 1DCNN, these are also some new algorithm has been developed in the literature. And we noticed that this algorithm is also superior. It means that we improve, so this kind of the algorithm, even with the 10 percentage, so the performance is also uh, better than existing approach. So now the point is that we have developed some learning models. So now we need to explain to everyone how this model is able to extract uh, these kind of the features. So the context of that uh, we have it in the, in the AI is that uh, basically based on AI explainable, it means that we need to interpret. So how the, how the model has decided to, for this uh, kind of the decision. So the point is that, as written here, is that so the, the model is developing is a, is a black box. So if you develop the, the intelligent model is a black box, and then if you look at the output and if you want to make a decision, so we have to be ensured that this decision or this output has been created based on some uh, parameter of the, the basic the important part of the system, but not based on the noise. 
because the noise can they, they change our decision. And this is the reason that if you look at the result, we need to, to explain that how it has been created. So therefore, we have a topic of explainable AI, and this topic is becomes more and more attractive in the, in the computer science and also in engineering society. So the main uh, idea is the, to address this question, how to understand uh, what the black box model learned in the fault diagnosis framework. So if you want to understand how this uh, black box uh, model learn uh, in the context of the fault diagnosis, we need to explain this uh, kind of that, uh, we need to develop the sort of uh, uh, explainable intelligent fault uh, diagnosis framework. But how to develop this explainable AI, we need to look at some post hoc visualization approach and therefore there are more development uh, techniques in the context of the post hoc visualization. So if I want to show you some uh, new the result, uh, first I need to explain how this can be applied to the, uh, to the fault diagnosis in terms of the vibrational data. So for instance, if you have a one-dimensional uh, vibrational signal, or if you convert to the time and frequency as the SDFD magnitude, then you can see that uh, some information can be appeared in this uh, image data. So now the point is that we need to explain if the fault exists and how this fault can be uh, appeared in the SDFD, and this could be the, uh, the basically the question in the context of the AI explainable. So assume that you have this SDFD plot, and then you want to use the CNN as the context of the supervised learning. It means that you have this architecture of the input data as the first convolutional block context uh, consists of the layer, a batch normalization, also the pooling layer. So you have these formulations based on the creation of the output. So if you look at this CNN, as I mentioned before, the <laughs> accuracy is very high. You, it's very uh, strong in the fault classification. But uh, the problem was uh, is a black box. So if you want to understand how this CNN has decided to, to, for the fault classification, so we need to use some uh, post hoc visualization techniques. For instance, we can use the classification activation map, CAM or GradCAM as a gradient base, GradCAM plus plus. Or another technique is the gradient free as a score CAM. These are some uh, score classification activation map. So if you want to see how this approach are able to, to, uh, to show some features, so this could be, for instance, uh, the CAM. So for the CAM approach, it's very simple. If you give this image data based on this uh, convolutional neural networks, but we need to pay attention that in the last layer, so we need to use some sort of the global average pooling layer based on the weighting CAM W1 to WN, so you can develop some sort of the class activation map as a saliency map. So now you can see that for different saliency map, you can you got it from this uh, CNN based on the weighting. So you can find the final uh, basic uh, saliency map. So you can see that, for instance, the picture of the dog, you can see some, uh, some uh, visualization can be appeared here. And this means that uh, you can, uh, based on the saliency map, you can uh, visualize uh, some, uh, some features from the image, so basically in, the, in your final, uh, final activation map. So now the, this has some uh, difficulties, because you need to modify the CNN, otherwise you are not able to apply it. So therefore, there is another approach, so it's a gradient base. As a grad camp, then you can see that by having this image data based on CNN and based on this uh, configuration, you can get a saliency map like this. But this saliency map is the same size, but the problem is that about the, is the localization, is a very coarse localization mapping. And of course, you don't need to modify the CNN but there are many tasks to be done in, in terms of to get this saliency map, and this is a basic, there's some uh, drawbacks for this. So there is another advantage, uh, another improvement to the GradCam++, but if you want to see what is the difference of the GradCam++ compared to GradCam, is you need to look at this, uh, this uh, weighting, because the, this uh, parameter is, can, be appear, can be calculated based on gradient uh, function, 
But here we are using the RELU function, and this means that you, we try to a little bit uh, speed up the, the computation process. Uh, but anyway, so this implementation of the, based on this RELU function, so this is the difference compared to GraphCam, but you can enhance your visualization. But uh, still the problem is uh, this computation of this uh, gradient base. So therefore, there is another uh, progress to come to a score camp. A score camp, you can avoid the gradient. It's a gradient free. But you can see that uh, if you are using this image data, so you have a face number one, you can use the CNN. And based on the upsample, you can, so at a different uh, scale manipulation, you can basically enhance your saliency map resolution. And then based on the face two, you can get uh, your final saliency map. But this uh, final saliency map is the same dimension as the image, as the input data, uh, but it's a, it has a better visualization. And therefore, uh, the better visualization means that you can capture the important feature in your data, so in the final the saliency map. So this was the reason that we focused on score CAM, and we tried to use it uh, for different uh, uh, problem in the fault diagnosis. So this time we use this data set, basically for the gearbox, you can see there are 16 teeth, 24 teeth, and this is a test bench, and we have used it basically for the data collection. Uh, but the, uh, very briefly, that uh, this has a two gearbox A and B, there are two shafts, so one is the torque actuator, one is the electric, it dry, is driven by the electrical motor, and, and, but the point is here that, if you have a failure, if you have, a, for example, there's some uh, a failure on the teeth of the gears, and based on the, this interaction of these uh, two uh, upper and the, low, uh, the bottom part, so at this position, uh, there are some phenomena can be appeared, and we need to look at it uh, very carefully, uh, and uh, I will explain you how to, to how, what kind of the failure we should expect it. So uh, again, you can see the picture of the, uh, this test bench. So we have used uh, for this uh, loading part, for this uh, amount of the torque, that there are some the sensor accelerometers. We have approximately a speed sensor, laser sensor. So, but the point is that the data has been collected so for different cycle. For example, 10 million cycle, it means after two and a half days, uh, approximately working the operation, and we, are, we test it for, the, for up to 50 million, it means that up to around the two weeks. So the system has been operated. So this is the effect of the micro pitting cracks. So because of, I'm talking about the cracks on the teeth of the gears, and as I explained for this test paint, there are two gears on the up and the bottom part, and based on interaction, and also there's some sort of the friction or some sliding effect is between the two, the two, two, the two gears. So important is to look at the, this direction. So if they are, if they are rotating as a, some sort of the, in the direction of the right uh, for, to the roots and also to, to the S direction, so we, can, we have it basically that the, the micro pitting can be propagated like this. Uh, but if, the, if the, they are propagating, uh, so if the direction based on a sliding effect, so the between like a friction as a, some sort of the sliding, so you can see that the micro pitting cracks can be propagated so in the, in, the, in the opposite direction to the tip direction. So this is the reason that the micro pitting on the cracks is propagated very rapidly, so that therefore is very important to see about the number of the cycles. You see that this is a ground, and then you see the picture of the, the progress of the micro pitting for the tooth number one. After two and a half days operation, after about one week, then you can see different uh, basic uh, plot for this uh, basically the, the micro pitting the cracks. So now the point is that if you want to classify, so because in this data set we have five different uh, level of the cracks. If you want to classify the different levels, we need to visualize how this learning model has learned to classify this kind of the failure. So these are the data in the time and frequency. Then you can see that uh, the, in the, in the, the, at the, for the ground at, after 10 million and 30 million cycle, so all the frequency and the time and space data is uh, located here. Now you can create the SDFT. So now we have a SDFT, the time and frequency, but there are some uh, features is located here and they are representing the different levels of the cracks. 
So now we need to use this uh, SDFD data and, to, and then to give it to the, our learning model and then to use uh, some sort of explanation how this, uh, what kind of the level exists in this data set. So this is uh, the result of the grad cam, is a gradient base. So uh, for this uh, 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 visualization, you can see that for the first level of the cracks, so the grad cam can give the, these, two, uh, these two basically the saliency map for these two STFD data. Uh, but the point is that if you move on to the second level of the cracks, then you can see that uh, you get this result. What does it mean? The first picture shows that in, the, in this range of the frequency for the high frequency and also low frequency, the noise is uh, significant and therefore you have no information of the cracks. But even if you uh, test it again for another STFT, then you see no, no data. It means that it fails to display, to explain, so what kind of information of the failure exists in this STFT data. So we try to look at GradCam++ and then we got this visualization and this visualization looks better because we get some uh, information and uh, up to level two, but I can tell you that this, if you repeat it up to level five, uh, at the level four, so this GradCam++ has no, uh, no display. It means that there is no information you can get it from this approach. So we repeat it with the score cam. In the score cam, we got another uh, saliency map, and this saliency map uh, at this range of frequency, you see some information. Now the point is that uh, how the, you can evaluate effectiveness of the different uh, basic uh, the visualization approach. So there is a function as the average drop. So average drop, it can be constructed as an index, as a metric, so you can see like this. So there are two input information as a YIC, as a score with the raw input data, and OIC is a score with the new input by the pointwise uh, multiplication with the saliency map. So if you uh, calculate this, uh, this average drop, then you can see that the uh, score cam, it gives you the lowest value. The lowest value is better because if, if the low value is uh, like this, is happier, it means that the average drop percent is much lower, and it means that the score cam has a better ability to represent, to explain, so that this kind of the, the, the fault classification. Of course, the other technique is like this. So this is the motivation to improve the, the, our visualization approach, and we also did some modification, so the, as, a, as a we call it, a, a smoothed a score cam, SS cam, and uh, we developed this kind of the architecture, so for this, uh, uh, this uh, smooth uh, score cam, as you see that uh, we are using the same SDFT with the same phase number one with the up sampling, we can get some basically uh, some, uh, 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 some uh, visualization like this. And this saliency map, you can bring it to this multiplication, but important is that in this uh, phase number two, we are using the sum uh, uh, several CNN. But if you remember that for the traditional uh, score camp, there is only one CNN, but here we have used some series of the, the as a parallel CNN. And another point is that here we have also added the noise. It's very important that if the noise exists in your saliency map, in your data set, and if you add some sort of the Gaussian noise, then you can excite your data, and then you see the effect of the noise on your saliency map has been created, and then based on this average uh, scoring, and there are some mathematical formulas here, so the finally we got the final uh, basic the score uh, saliency map with the same dimension of the input data, and then we can notice that what kind of information you can capture from this statency map. Of course, the CNN is like this. We have used it here. So this was the, the, uh, the new progress on the visualization. And if I want to show you the effectiveness, so if you remember that I told you that for this data set, because it's very complicated for the gearbox, so at the level four, so we didn't got any result for the GradCam++. Now, if you want to see that how the a a smooth a score cam, it can give, it can gives you the, the, this kind of the performance. You can, for example, look at this plot, and this is the, our saliency. 
basically the SDFD, and this is our uh, the basically the visualization based on SS scan. And uh, then, you, uh, but here you can notice that uh, these are the frequency, and this frequency are exactly has been uh, classified in the in the frequency plot. It means that uh, this range of explanation is exactly correspond to this range of frequency, and this frequency are representing the the, the level four uh, fault in our crack data. Uh, but if you look at the f f picture on the right, so if you are using the, so this visualization, so the, but uh, you notice that uh, these are the effect of the uh, some noise, and this can be basically appeared here. Uh, but the point is that a standard uh, CNN, if you are using, so the, it's not able to use uh, to classify the basically the fault. Then you can notice that there are some sort of classification of information appeared here, but it means that the, the focus, the focus of your saliency map is not on the information of the fault, because these are so a focus on information of the noise, and therefore this uh, a standard uh, CNN, if you are using for the fault classification and also visualization, it's failing. So this was the reason that this progress, it can give us the better visualization, uh, but uh, the last but not least, and also based on the time, I would like very briefly talk about another progress about the multi-source information fusion. So uh, what is the problem in the mechanical fault diagnosis? You are using some fixed operating condition for some uh, information of the fault you have. It means that you are using some source fault mode, for example here, but the point is that uh, these are some, for example, the common fault. And then you can basically try to classify. But the problem is that if the, the operating condition will be changed, or if the new fault is coming to the machine, so this operating condition, this uh, scenarios, it doesn't work. So for instance, if you are using the classical approach, for example, for the fault classification, and even you have some unknown fault modes, for example, this uh, with this uh, uh, picture. So then you can see that if you are using the traditional domain adaptation approach, so you cannot classify it because there are some mismatching. But the point is that uh, based on the, some sort of the technique of the domain adaptation, so you can classify the fault. You can see that if you are using some ideal domain adaptation, even if you have uh, some unknown fault in the machine, so this can be classified very well. So nowadays, so it's very important, especially for mechanical engineering, because we have a very complicated data sets, and if you have uh, some unknown uh, fault modes, uh, we can use uh, some new techniques I want to explain here as a multi-source open, so open domain adaptation. So what does it mean? Multi-source means that if you have a multi-source data set, for example, for different operating condition, so the open set, if you know the open set, we need to know what is the closed set. The closed set means that you already closed your, uh, all the faults. It means that you know all the information of the fault. But if happens some fault like this, if in the target you have uh, some new fault, but you don't consider it in your domain, it means that we need to look at the open set. So now we have developed the multi-source uh, open set domain adaptation for the fault diagnosis. It means that we can consider the different operating condition in the data sets based on the multi-source, and even based on the new faults, we, are, uh, we have an open set. It means any fault can be in, uh, included. So for this kind of the, the basic exam examination, so we need to develop the new metrics, and this new metric is a similarity matrix. You need to ha you have an open source data, uh, and then you have you have a source data set, and you have a target. You have a two sets. So you have a, the basic the source data set, and then you have a target, and then you need to develop the sort of the basic similarity measure uh, of each target sample to the source domain. So it means that if each of the target samples is, is corresponding to one samples in the basic, in the source domain, so you can uh, uh, establish some metrics as a similarity metrics. So this similarity metric is based on the entropy, is based on the confidence, and also uh, based on the consistence between the data sets. 
So it means that if you have an imbalanced data set based on the new faults, and then the consistency will be changed. So now, if you look at this mathematical as the entropy, so the y hat means that this is the probability of the estimation of the basically the, uh, the sample fault in, this, in the target source. So over the, all the existing the label data you have in the target source. So based on this uh, calculation of the entropy and also this uh, kind of the, the mean values try to, uh, to enhance the weightings. So we have also the sort of the consistency the calculation we can introduce uh, this uh, weighting term as a WIT. So this, uh, this kind of the, the calculation of the similarity is uh, you can see that uh, based on the, this entropy function, consistency, and also the confidence, it uh, and also I need to explain that based on this normalization, so all of this term is also between the, the this uh, weighting are between the zero and one, and therefore this uh, function can be created. So we need also to develop another mechanism as a weighted adversarial mechanism. And if you look at this uh, loss function for adversarial mechanism, it has a two part. It looks like a game. Because here you have uh, the target sample data, and here you have uh, the, the, the target source data. Here there are two functions, f and f. These are the sum uh, share feature extraction. And the GJ is the source feature, also the source feature extraction. I, I can show you in the next picture. Uh, so in this case, and also the function D is for the discriminator. So in, in this case, so this adversarial training, and if you add this weighting, the WIT, you got it from this calculation, and therefore we call it as a weighted, you see? So weighted means that in this uh, game, in this game, we don't uh, we give different uh, weight to the target source data compared to the to the source data, and then we come into another metrics function we can calculate as a LUK as a pseudo label sample for train unknown mode detectors. So this is for the unknown mode detector. It means that if you have a new default in the machine, so in your data set, so how this uh, function can be updated. So the, here we have uh, the mechanism K as a detector, as a, this is a for the unknown mode detector. Maybe I can, it's better to show you this picture. So in this picture, you can see that here we have a multi-source from the, the different uh, data set, for example, operating condition. Here we have a source sample, target samples. So this is a function F as a share feature extractor, and then we have uh, the another uh, function as a GI. This is a source specific feature extractor. So now you can see that for the shear feature extractor, you can implement based on the two convolutional block, you can see with the 32 filter and the eight is also the sliding. And then we have for the GI, how it can be implemented based on again the three convolutional blocks. So here we have a function uh, basically D, this is a basically for the, the source a specific dis uh, uh, discriminator. Another function H, you can uh, uh, create it based on the fully connected layer. It's a mutual supervised module. But you see that this uh, discriminator and also the, this H, uh, so they are uh, connected based on the fully connected layer. So you can see how this uh, co a structure, but you need to compare it to the F, to the, to the source a specific classifier, because this is also the fully connected layer. But the, the point is that here you need to put only the two neurons in the last layer, but here you need to put YS. The YS, it means that all the label data you have for the target source. So based on this mechanism, and also the point is that the, uh, the, for open source, the, the, the problem is here. You have an unknown mode detector. So this unknown mode detector so should be designed, and therefore I explain you in this uh, presentation, so sorry. So I think I need to come back. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I think if not. Oh, yes, OK, thank you. OK, okay so I want to explain that uh, if you look at here, the, this set, uh, for example, for this unknown fault detector K, and also this discriminator. So these all should be realized based on this uh, convolutional block and the fully connected layer I, I mentioned as the architecture here. 
So this algorithm, the SOV, is the open set multi-source domain adaptation diagnosis model, and therefore we call it as if the unknown fault exists, so you can predict the health state. So as a, because of time, I go a bit uh, quickly. So on this uh, sim uh, testing data we have, so we consider this a rolling mill test platform. If you look at here, so here there are six uh, states. So one is the healthy case, and there are three faults for the inner race, uh, uh, roll, uh, uh, roll bearing fault, and also the outer race. And there are two faults from excited. This excited, if you look at the bottom of this test paint, they give some vibration at different frequencies of the machine. So there are six uh, uh, states. So if you have a different task, uh, because uh, 600 RPM or 1,200 uh, RPM, it means that you have a two data set for different RPM of machine, and then you have a target at the another RPM. Okay, so based on this table, this is a diagnosis task under different degrees of openness. So the point is that I can, ex for example, if you look at the condition of a task B3, then you can see that it says uh, 0135. It means that the two and number six are missing. It means that, it means that in this openness, there are two unknown fault in the machine, but you didn't count in your data set. So if you look at this uh, performance of this system, you can see this open uh, OSMDA, it gives you the better performance in the accuracy for the fault class, uh, for the, even uh, for the fault classification compared to the other techniques. For example, here we have a OSMDA, is a, this uh, open set the domain adaptation. Even you can compare to the another the OSWA as an open set, uh, this uh, weighted uh, adversarial networks. It means that the performance is much better. So if you remember that in OSMDA we have a mochal, so the unit, but if there is no mochal, the, then you can see the performance is uh, lower than our approach. So this is also again about the comparison of the fault accuracy for the undone fault by different modes. Again, you can see that for the different, uh, for the unknown fault, again, the performance of OSMD is, uh, is better compared to other cases. Uh, okay, so uh, the, uh, uh, this could be the last uh, simulation part. Then you can see that if you look at this uh, confidence, uh, uh, confusion metrics, then you will notice that uh, if for the task B3, I uh, explained you in the previous uh, slide, if you are using, for example, some domain adaptation based on neural networks, if you compare to OSMDA, then you will see that this, uh, this uh, domain adaptation, so it's not uh, the confusion, so basically for this uh, fault, uh, the, this fault, for the unknown fault is zero. It means that the performance is fa failing. And this is also about the classification. Then you can see that for the unknown fault, it's uh, represented by the red uh, plot. If there are some confusion, it means that it cannot classify it well. Uh, but if you look at, the, 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 uh, for example, this uh, T-distributed uh, stochastic uh, neighbor uh, embedded uh, plot, then you will see that for the, this uh, confusion metrics, so then you will get a better result, and then this could be classification, and this is also for the classification for the second data set. It means that for the first source and the second source, again, for both cases, you have a better classification, and then you remember that for this uh, task number three, the two fault number two and number four are missing. It means that these are the unknown fault. So very briefly that in this part, because of time, we try to make a very car, car in the compressed way, but if you are interested, you are very welcome to look at uh, this new publication. So basically it's addressing the, this open set uh, multi-source domain adaptation so, and also if you are interested to other part of presentation, you're welcome to look at this result. And then thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And of course, uh, if you have any questions, so please do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karimi, for your great and very inspiring presentation. Uh, we have a time for one or two short questions, but uh, there will be a great opportunity to talk with Professor Karimi during the lunchtime and also uh, today and uh, tomorrow. Professor Karimi is taken until tomorrow late afternoon, so 
there will be very many possibilities f uh, for you to talk with him. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Professor Korbic, you're welcome. Dear Hamid, thank you a lot for very interesting uh, talk uh, and, uh, and topics. Uh, in this uh, area, the main problem is uh, robustness with respect to different uh, activities. And uh, you consider the vibration system. And vibration system, I think, uh, is this uh, problem of noise. Problems and noise. And could you say a little word more about <coughs> on one hand, you applied specially uh, deep, neural, deep neural networks or traditional networks. How this uh, technology, how this method, it, our, this, this, our uh, no, I can say, robust, uh, pro, uh, produce robust with respect to noise, a uh, uh, problem of noise, of course, and robustness. Okay, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So, actually, the, this is a very important question about the resilience or the robustness of our algorithm with respect to the noise, because, uh, in fact, uh, based on my knowledge, so there are two main problems uh, if you want to use the deep learning for the mechanical or uh, engineering application. The first thing is that the engineering application are changing. At the, for there are different operating condition, and this change of operating condition, so then it brings some difficulty to trust to your model and the, how the decision has been made. And therefore, the, the, the last two part of my presentation is to cover the topic of the, the trustworthy model, how much you can trust to the learning model. So in this case, we need to develop some visualization techniques to understand how much the model has learned such a feature. So another important about the noise, so uh, for instance, in the vibration, we have it, uh, some sort of the low frequency noise, and even we have some high frequency noise uh, based on some electrical application. So this is the reason that if you develop the learning model, so we shouldn't say that it's already done because we need to test it. And therefore, uh, we need to look at uh, the, some sort of the postdoc visualization. And this was the reason that, uh, for instance, in this presentation, so uh, for instance, uh, for instance here, so these are the effect of the noise. And this effect of the noise, and if we don't look at this saliency map, we, we cannot understand uh, if the noise exists or not. And this was the reason that, uh, so now the, there is a big discussion, so because this uh, society is a control society, I look at there is a session about the fault detection, the fault to run control. Uh, so nowadays, uh, so the AI is uh, progressing a lot, uh, coming to the control society, especially in the fault, because we deal with a huge data. So uh, what we need, uh, not only to develop the learning model, but you need also to explain that. So how much the model has learned, how uh, much we can trust. So for instance, based on this uh, grad camp, so we can say that the noise exists and this is uh, the representation. Otherwise, if you look at your STFT data, you cannot see effect of the noise. But if you give it to this learning model, then this effect of the noise will be directly appear. So this is the one reason that, uh, so the, uh, of course, uh, uh, the robustness against to the noise, so uh, it might be appeared in the classification, but this classification, if we don't do such an explanation, we cannot trust to the result. Of course, we can say that 90% we have uh, uh, classified, or 97. So in the first part of my presentation, I show you that I, we developed the RNFC, with a high percentage, we could uh, classify the low quality data. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, we don't know if this learning is adapted to the noise and not adapted to the failure. And sometimes the noise brings some confusion. So in the decision making, and this is the reason that, so uh, this uh, topic in the AI context as the explainable AI uh, is developing very rapidly. There are few uh, workshop in USA Europe also has started. So the, we organized one uh, webinar uh, last year about this explanation uh, for the fuzzy and also the neural network. But in fact, uh, in my opinion, in the next five to uh, at least uh, next four or five years, uh, in engineering site is very important because everybody can develop the learning model, but nobody comes to explain so how much it has been tested. And this ex uh, explanation is uh, based on this kind of visualization. 
we have started and also the, we did some collaboration, but we, uh, still we are doing this uh, topic from engineering side and uh, because this is a very important question as the professor uh, first week mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the other questions can be asked in the lobby. I would like to thank you one more time and also I would like to say that Professor Karimi will uh, give a seminar to PhD students uh, tomorrow from 10.30. Uh, helping them to develop their career. It's also open to early stage researchers. It will be in lecture room B, the Faculty of Automatic Control, Electronics and Computer Science. Thank you one more time. And I would like to cordially welcome uh, the rector of the Salesian University of Technology, Professor Arkadiusz Menzik, who came from just from the Senate meeting. Professor Menzik, uh, the rector, would you like to say a few words to our participants? Mm -hmm. Professor Karim, thank you very much for your excellent speech and we hope for the further cooperation not only with the Faculty of Automatic Control but also with the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering where the group of working on diagnostic system using artificial intelligence is also present and very active. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Silesian University uh, in Gliwice. Uh, I, I am very happy that nearly after 60 years the conference is being held here again. So it's our great pleasure and Gliwice uh, is a special city. We have a big part of Katowice's special economic zone and um, the, the city is the city of growing economy and uh, scientific center, not only university but, but also institutes coming from industry and Polish Academy of Science. Uh, I do hope that your stay in Gliwice will be very pleasant and uh, the conference will be very fruitful. I, I wish you very nice uh, talks, uh, speeches and, and strengthening the contacts, personal and professional contacts. Enjoy your stay at Gliwice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Director. Now I would like to invite you for lunch. And uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll start another plenary session. So we are welcome to come to this room. Thank you.